have a special treat today. We have um, our uh, guest pastor here today is Reverend Gordon Smith. In your bulletin, you see his lovely picture, and he's even more beautiful in person. Uh, he's joining us uh, as Heike is finishing um, heading on to annual conference this week. And uh, Reverend Gordon is a retired clergy, so we are very blessed to have him here preaching for us today and performing the service of Holy Communion. You know, you really think that the uh, pastor operates the church and gives direction. Now, nah, it's, it's the church manager. It's Kate. I know that. And uh, she was very quick to tell me what I need to do, what I don't need to do, and don't do. And I appreciate that very much. Also, I appreciate her reading the scripture. I like, uh, I like the lay people to read the scripture, especially when it has words that I can't pronounce. Like Parthenians and Medes and Elamites, etc. So thank you very much, Kate. And I appreciate uh, Dr. Miller giving me this opportunity. She and George have been on a brief vacation and now be headed up to annual conference. You know, I saw in the, saw in the bulletin annual conferences this week. Oh, gee, I didn't know that. Uh, who cares? No. Attitudes change when you retire. But yes, we're going up. We're going up for the retirement uh, service and for the um, memorial service especially. Uh, the longer I'm here in this conference, the more of my, my friends and colleagues, my peers, my mentors are on either of those two lists, either retiring or, or retiring to heaven. And uh, so it's always a meaningful time to go and visit friends and, and renew acquaintances. And I appreciate Heike giving me this opportunity. I also want to say a word of thanks to Ron Gillis. It's always a joy to be here to hear uh, the music that he selects, the choir is beautiful. I do, I do want to say this though, uh, the choir was here in the first service, they heard me preach, you saw them leave, I don't know. <laughs> you are forewarned, but some of them actually came back. But Ron, thank you so much for your leadership, your guidance, the great music you pick, and notice all the songs today were spirit songs, which works great for, for my, my sermon this morning, thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you for being here and for sharing in this time of holy worship. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we come before you this morning that we might be blessed with your word. We ask that you would send forth your Holy Spirit. We have, we've sung about that spirit coming. We've given you thanks for the power of your Holy Spirit. We've heard the words of Scripture read about the coming of the Spirit at Pentecost. So now, Lord, let your spirit descend upon us even in the midst of this sermon that we might know and understand who you are in our lives and who we are in yours. This we pray in Christ, with Christ, and through Christ. Amen. Jews from all over the known world had gathered in Jerusalem for this great festival of weeks, or as the Jew, uh, Greek Jews called it, Pentecost. People from all over had come into Jerusalem. The streets were crowded, person elbow to elbow, shoulder to shoulder, people going to the temple and from the temple to, to worship and, and to offer their sacrifice. In a room along one of the streets were gathered the small band of followers of Jesus. And they were waiting. No, they were prayerfully waiting for the coming and the promise of God, the promise of power. It was just a few days ago that, that Jesus was with his followers, the few that they were. He had been crucified, died, and he was buried, and he rose from the dead, and they witnessed this risen Christ. And he told them this in Acts 1-4, Jesus ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised. He said, this is what you heard from me. John baptized with water, but in only a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now the scriptures are not really very clear about this, but there may have been as many, many as 120 people in that room. All of them were praying, waiting, and hoping for the promise of God. 
then something happened. Something very much out of the ordinary, something otherworldly, something that defied rational explanation. There was a sound like the howling of a fierce wind filling the entire house where the apostles had gathered. They saw what seemed to be individual flames of fire alighting, alighting on each one of them. The crowds in the street heard the sound of the wind and, and they saw the apostles reeling from the experience and they thought them drunk, even though it was early in the morning. And I'm certain there was some laughter ringing out across the streets when they said, hey, y'all, y'all come here. Look at these idiots. It's not even 9 o'clock in the morning and they're already drunk. Or, or maybe, maybe they're still drunk from last night. But yet, something strange was happening. Something phenomenal was happening. Those who were close by heard these believers speaking in languages that they understood, like their home language, their native language. Was that what they heard? Or was this some kind of drunken, drunken babbling? Sort of like, sounded like the language. Then Peter likely leaned out of a window and he called out to them. He see, Luke says, he stood with the other 11 apostles. He raised his voice and declared, Judeans and everyone living in Jerusalem, know this. Listen carefully to my words. These people aren't drunk, as you suspect. After all, it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. Rather, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. This was that day, according to Peter. It was a brand new day for the world. Faith of fire had been ignited. And I've got good news for you this morning. It's still burning. Now, if y'all were Baptists, somebody would say amen to that one. Let's talk about our spiritual founder. Let's talk about John Wesley. John Wesley was not a very imposing figure. He was only five feet, two inches tall. And if you've read any of his sermons, you would have found them extremely boring. Very long and with a lot of big words. Like many of us who went to seminary, we, we paid a lot of money to learn a lot of big words, and so we want to use them. And that's what John Wesley did. But yet, people flocked to hear him preach. They came from all over England. They came from the mines, from the streets, from the bars to hear this man preach. Why? Why would they even bother to come hear this squirt, rattle off words they didn't understand? There was a fire. There was a fire within the heart of John Wesley that burned brightly in a dark and morose world. It was the fire of his faith that attracted folks. It was the fire of Pentecost that burned in John Wesley. Now, we fondly remember our father of faith, but you know, this saint of our faith struggled with his faith every day. John and Charles Wesley, you may not have known this, they were missionaries. They came to Georgia, they came to America, in 1737, to bring the gospel at the invitation of Governor Oglethorpe. And John Wesley failed miserably. He was crushed. He thought his faith was totally gone. He snuck out of Georgia in the darkness of night. He was a man defeated. And as he was sailing back to England that year, he found aboard the ship a group of Moravians, a sect uh, of Christians. And when a great storm brewed, Wesley called it a hurricane, he saw their faith as they prayed for God's providence and God's protection over them during this storm. He, he was so taken with their great faith that he wanted to know more about it. So he began to check out these people called Moravians. Returning to England, he continued to preach, though only half-heartedly. And then Wesley met a Moravian bishop. 
His name was Peter Bowler. That's an important name in United Methodist history. Peter Bowler. They became fast friends. And Bowler became one of the biggest encouragers for John Wesley. It was early 1738. 1738, long time ago. The Wesleys returned from Georgia. Peter Bowler entered Wesley's life. And preaching was never the same. This is from Wesley's journal in the spring of 1738. I found my brother, this is Charles, I found my brother at Oxford recovering from his pleurisy and with him Peter Bowler by whom in the hand of God I was on Sunday the 5th clearly convinced of unbelief of the want of that faith by which alone we are saved. Immediately it struck into my mind, leave off preaching. How can you preach to others who have not faith yourself? I asked Bowler whether he thought I should leave, off, leave it off or not. He answered, by no means. I asked, but how can I preach? He said, preach faith till you have it. And because you have it, you will preach faith. The fire of the Holy Spirit was at work in Peter Bowler and in John Wesley. And folks, we today are inheritors of that fire. Pentecost is for us a day to remember. It is a reminder that we have the power and the presence of God's Holy Spirit through whom we are the church in the world. That same Spirit who gave Peter the first Christian sermon ever preached and gave John Wesley Peter Bowler gives us the power to be faithful and fruitful disciples of Jesus Christ. Now we cannot be the church that God wants us to be without full reliance on the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit because I know that without that power and presence, without the Holy Spirit, I could never have been a pastor in the United Methodist Church. Since I became a Christian in 1973, I've struggled with what that means. Oh, I, I can spout the words of faith. I can go through the motions of being a person of faith. But there's one thing I cannot do. I cannot lie to God. I struggle still with what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Every day I pray for the power and the presence of God's Holy Spirit to, to recreate me, to enable me to be the person that, that God wants me to be. In some ways I very easily relate to John Wesley when he asked Peter Bowler, how can you preach to others when you have not faith yourself? Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like your faith wasn't quite strong enough or good enough? Have you ever felt like, well, maybe I've kind of lost grip on faith and things just kind of slipping away from me? Well, you're in good company. You're in the company of Peter. You're in the company of John Wesley. You're in the company of Gordon Smith. Most of us have had that kind of experience in our walk of faith. I'm glad. I'm glad that I struggle with what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Because that puts my faith on a growing edge. It helps me hone what it is God wants me to be. If I ever am content with the idea that I have it made as a Christian, there is no doubt in my mind that my faith will die a sure and steady death. Every day I have to renew this commitment to Christ. Pentecost was for the Jew a time to renew the covenant that was made between God and God's people. 
And as we think about that, we, we all need to renew our covenants about who we are and whose we are. We all need to renew what it means to be a follower of Jesus. We all need to remind ourselves that the God we serve is a living God, not a static God, but a God who lives among us, who inspires us, who challenges us, who empowers us. Pentecost is that day. Pentecost is that day to rekindle a time for us to remember, to rekindle the fire of faith that we know lies within. As we remember this story of Pentecost and the powerful effect of Peter's sermon on the people who heard it, we can renew our own covenant with God, the covenant made through our baptism and confirmed through the sacrament of Holy Communion. We burn with a holy fire, a holy fire that we might be disciples of Jesus. University United Methodist Church, you have been a church immersed in the ministry of Jesus. Every time that I come here, or the Linda and I come to worship, I enjoy looking at your wall of fame out here, looking at those preachers. And I got to tell you, it's tearful sometimes. I, I knew these people. I appreciate them. They were my peers. They were my mentors. Some of them had such an impact on my ministry that I would not be here had it not been for some of them. What a heritage you have. What a spiritual fire has burned here in this church. You have accomplished great things for our Lord. But I want you to know there's still more to be done. Your job isn't over. So let faith burn here at University United Methodist Church with such an intensity that it will become a congregation that would engulf anyone who comes in contact with you. I challenge you this morning to do three things through the month of June. I challenge you, number one, to pray daily for the power of God's Holy Spirit to be within your heart and in the heart of University Church. I challenge you to read the second chapter of Acts every day throughout this rest of this month of June, but read it in a different translation every day. Go to BibleGateway.com. They've got a myriad of translations. Read it in a different translation each day and, and ask, how is it that you can incorporate in your life, in your ministry, in your walk of faith, that fire, that fire that came at Pentecost? Thirdly, I want you to invite at least one other person to come and join you in worship. Now that's going to take a lot of guts. That's the hardest thing of these three things to do. Invite someone to come to church with you. And then invite them to ask you questions about your faith. Uh-oh, now you stop preaching and start meddling. Let them ask you about your faith. Tell them the story of University Church. Tell them your story. The promise of Christmas, the hope of Easter has been fulfilled. This is Pentecost. The fire has been ignited, like John Wesley. Let your faith burn brightly in this world. Let us pray. Holy God, oh, we're so bold to come before you and ask things of you, but Lord, we ask for your Holy Spirit to be in our hearts in a powerful way. Renew us, Lord, speak to us. Enliven us, challenge us, dare us, but before all, empower us to be the church. For this we pray in Christ's name. Amen.